go. Okay, so now you know. Recording in progress. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so there may be people coming in, um, not in any way that they can, <laughs> physically and on Zoom. So I will write their names down as I become aware of them. Hi, I'm Linda Dickman. Hi. <laughs> Welcome to the Northport Arts Coalition, uh, Poets in Fort Reading. Um, and um, there are very few rules. And, and, we, and that's all we ask is that you observe the very few. Um, I mean, you're here, so obviously you're good poets. We ask that all content be family friendly, no politics, no sexually explicit work and no proselytizing. Be mindful of your audience, please. Now, I will tell you that I also attend a reading in England where they say something very different. They say, this is an adult reading. And if you have children, please ask them to leave the room to be mindful of your audience, please. And I thought that was a nice way of putting it. So there's, you know, just very different. Anyway, let me tell you about Dan. Dan, I, I have a, been a, a loving going to Daniel Kerr's reading for some time. I don't even know how many years, um, but it's been fun because Dan runs a tight ship and um, he knows what he's doing and he has he has things that he likes to happen and he and they happen because that's the way Dan does it. And it help, it's good mentorship for me. I'm a little bit more loose about things. Um, but let me tell you something about him. I mean, we talked about our Myers-Briggs and any of you that know what the Myers-Briggs is. And I know he was a J and he, and I'm a P. <laughs> and we're just like, he's left brain and I'm to write a poem about it. But, you know, so it's really nice to work with somebody that's different, but similar. So Daniel Basil Kerr, CPA, PhD, is a cross-cultural consultant focused on helping people and organizations be more inclusive and work more effectively across borders. He were, he teaches accounting at St. Joseph's College and Suffolk Community College. Dan is the moderator of the all of the monthly All Souls Church Second Saturdays poetry reading. His poems about religion, politics, history, and growing up in Asherokin in the 60s have been published in Bard's Annual, Suffolk County Poetry Review, Performance Poets Association, Beat Generation. Bards Against Hunger, and other anthologies. Dan, Dan didn't write this down because I can't imagine him saying this about himself, but he really works to, to live what he believes, and he wants to bring people together, and that's my aim as well. So um, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Daniel Kerr to the podium. It's a pleasure to be here. And this is a homecoming for me. I've lived in Stony Brook since 1982, but as a kid, I lived in Asherokin. And of course, Asherokin had a gas station and a nursery, so everything happened in North Beach. So we're here at the Presbyterian Church. Uh, right across the street is the much bigger Roman Catholic Church, St. Philip Neri, where I had gone to school for eight years. So for eight years, I looked at this building. Um, and that was, I graduated from that grammar school in 1970. The world was a bit different then. And I was the youngest of eight children. And the next brother in line did something radical back then. He married a Presbyterian from this church. Her name was Kathy Haney. And she was very nervous when she had to meet with the Catholic priest. And the priest asked her over at St. Philip's there at the rectory, Kathy, uh, what religion are you? are you Catholic? And she said, no. Well, what religion are you? When she was very nervous, she said something the priest didn't expect to hear. She said, prostitution, Father. <laughs> she had a way with words. So let me begin. Um, my poems are about, it's somewhat autobiographical. They, they describe the 60s. They describe faith. I st stayed away from the political poems, but this first poem I thought would be an appropriate way to start on my return to Northport. And it's entitled <clears throat> Jack Kerouac and the Nuns of Northport. Northport of the 1960s had Gunther's Bar and St. And, and Philip Neri School. From his bar stool at Gunther's, Jack Kerouac guided the beatniks. From their perch overlooking Northport Village, the nuns of St. Philip's guided me. Bob Dylan sang the times they are a changing, and it did for the nuns, 
for me, for the Catholic Church, for the country, and for the world. The nuns got me at six. I, aware, I arrived wearing a big white tag with my name and phone number and address. The kids were all in uniform and the nuns were all dressed as penguins. While Mother Superior blew her whistle in Northport, Pope John opened Vatican II in Rome. As I learned to hide under my desk to avoid nuclear bombs, Rachel Carson published Silent Spring. The mass was in Latin, and I learned all about purgatory and hell. Martin Luther King shared, shared his dream, and many dreams died in Dallas. Pope John declared Jews did not kill Christ, and I received my first communion. The Beatles invaded the United States, and Nelson Mandela was banished to Robbins Island. The mass changed from Latin to English, and the priest began to face the congregation. Miniskirts first appeared, and Malcolm X disappeared. I received my first communion, and Vatican II said we should study the Bible. Chairman Mao launched the Cultural Revolution, and Star Trek boldly went where no man had gone before. I discovered girls and an occasional tightness in my pants. Christian Barnard transplanted a human heart, and Israel put a stake in the heart of the Arab world. I became an altar boy, and my brother volunteered to fight in Vietnam. Martin Luther King was killed in Memphis, and the Tet Offensive killed the US and Vietnam. Russian tanks rolled into Czechoslovakia and crushed the Prague Spring. I heard a nun curse the day Nixon was declared the winner over Humphrey. Some nuns changed their habits, showed their hair, and began using the name their parents gave them. Many of the older nuns remained the same. As the country divided, so did the nuns. I discovered booze and dreamed of going to Gunther's. Neil Armstrong, Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, and Teddy Kennedy drowned both Mary Jo and a dream of another Kennedy, another President Kennedy. I discovered Che Guevara, Jerry Rubin, Sololinsky, and Orlo Guthrie, and my brother was dragged to Vietnam for a second tour. On my religion midterm, I explained how Joe Namath was like Christ, and as the New Testament New York Jets defeated the Old Testament Baltimore Colts in, Bo in Super Bowl III. Hare signaled the age of Aquarius, and Jack Kerouac died. Before he died, he declared, I'm not a beatnik, I'm a Catholic. In eighth grade, we celebrated the first Earth Day, and the loud guns of Kent State killed the 1960s. The day after the shooting, we gathered in prayer at the beginning of math class. Sister Eleanor was one of those nuns that kept the old habit and never changed her name. She asked if we had any prayer intentions, and I raised my hand. For the young students gunned down by the fascist National Guard, we pray to the Lord, and we all said, amen. And then Sister Eleanor responded, for the brave National Guardsmen defending this country against the evil of communism, we pray to the Lord, and we all said, amen. Bob Dylan was right. The times, they were a-changing. The 1960s changed me, the nuns, the Catholic Church, the country, and the world. Almost 50 years gone by, I thank the nuns of Northport for guiding me through the changes. I often hear their voices in my head and in my heart, especially when I step into Gunther's for a beer. If you close your eyes and listen carefully, you can hear Jack Kerouac's voice at Gunther's as well. He shared Northport with the nuns of St. Philip's in the 1960s. So this next poem is both family and a comment on culture. And it's called Bermuda Potatoes. Yeah. Bermuda Potatoes. I was the youngest, a little background, I was the youngest of eight kids. Here goes. I was the straw that broke my camel's, well, that I broke my mother's back. A big house in Huntington Bay, eight kids was too much for my mom to handle. Elvira left her family and the soft apartheid 
of 1950s Bermuda to change my diapers and cook and clean house for a large family living on the North Shore of Long Island. She arrived in the US as an immigrant with little education and went to complete high school, become a US citizen, graduate from college, and become an administrator at Stony Brook University. One day long ago at dinner, I refused to eat the potatoes. And Elvira told me firmly, these are not just potatoes, these are Bermuda potatoes. From that point on, she only served Bermuda potatoes. Elvira introduced me to Aesop's fables and the wisdom of the Bible as she understood it. She said, you don't have to like your brothers and sisters, you just have to love them. She said, your mother named you Daniel. Always have the courage of the Daniel in the Bible to speak truth to power. Although she was very black, it never occurred to me as a child that Elvira was not my mother's sister. The realities of race and racism were learned outside my home. And I began to refer to Elvira as my black aunt. During the summer, she often teased my sisters saying, I'll always have a better tan than you. Whenever turkey was served for dinner, she always said the dark meat is much more flavorful. Later in life, Elvira introduced me to her friends and family. She said, this is Daniel. He's the white sheep of the family. Although Elvira was loved at home, she was not exempt from the long arm of racism on Long Island. When she left my parents' employ when I was six, she returned to live with us because she could not find an apartment. She said, I called the number in the paper to confirm the apartment was still available. But when I arrived, the landlord said it was already rented. Elvira's proper British accent opened the door. Her black skin slammed it in her face. Whenever I hear someone say white privilege is a myth, I think of the pain of my Aunt Elvira. In Bermuda, they have a tradition when someone dies. The person closest to the deceased reads their biography at the funeral. When her family asked me to perform this special task, they reminded me I was to read what was written and only what was written. At the church in Hamilton, I followed the script until I came to the last line. Script said she came to America for a better life. I added, and made America a better place for everyone she touched. After the funeral, the family gave me a picture. I'm looking at it now. A young Elvira is looking at me with a big smile on her face. A few weeks ago, I changed the picture frame and I discovered why she was smiling so broadly. I recognized Elvira's handwriting on the back of the picture. It said, I became a US citizen. February 2nd, 1962, Riverhead, New York. Okay, youngest of eight, and I've got a brother I called the big chicken. <laughs> big chicken. Now, why do I call him the big chicken? He's owned a Chick-fil-A franchise in Raleigh, North Carolina for over 40 years. The big chicken. Here goes. It's gonna be a pretty scary thought at the beginning. If I were three inches taller, had a bigger smile, and spoke with a Southern accent, I would be my brother, Charlie. If my moral compass was always true, if I forgave more easily and spent more time helping broken human beings, I would be my brother, Charlie. If I burned down the woods when I was a little kid, but tried to put the fire out myself and then went to the police to report it, I'd be my brother, Charlie. If I was a star football player in high school, winning every single game when I was a junior and losing every one when I was a senior, I would be my brother, Charlie. If I stopped other junior high kids from bullying the gay kid in the 1960s, shared a room with the first black football player at the Citadel in 1970s, and today own the only Chick-fil-A in North Carolina that composes its waste, I would be my brother, Charlie. If I were a better Christian, I studied the Bible regularly and volunteered to sit in for caregivers so that they could get a break, I would be my brother, Charlie. If I was a Boy Scout leader most of my adult life, guided countless Eagle Scouts on their projects, 
and took scouts camping when I was in my 70s and had two bad knees, I would be my brother Charlie. If I read more books, took more walks on the beach, and prayed more often, I would be my brother Charlie. If I was always the last one off the plane, because I helped the old ladies with their bags and the young mothers with their babies and made sure to thank the pilot and the freight crew before getting off the plane, I would be my brother Charlie. If I provided a better example of a life well read and spread goodwill and humor with everyone I met, I would be my brother Charlie. If I listened more, spoke less, and took myself less seriously, I would be my brother Charlie. If I grew up in Alabama in the 1930s and a black man was falsely accused of raping a white woman and I had the courage and character of Atticus Finch, I would be my brother Charlie. Thank you. Okay, commentary on culture from the point of view of advertisements on TV in the 1960s. And it's called, Are They Still in Good Hands? Mm -hmm. Growing up in the 1960s, I watched a lot of TV with my family. Ed Sullivan introduced us to the Beatles. Walter Cronkite brought the Vietnam War into our living room. There was Bonanza and the Wonderful World of Disney. But it was the colorful characters from the commercials that connected Star Trek to the Twilight Zone. No matter how chaotic the world became, we were always in good hands with Allstate. As the world turned, what happened to these angels of commerce? Did the Lucky Charms leprechaun retire to the Valley of the Green Giant? Did Josephine the plumber ever run into the Tidy Bowl Man? Did the children singing bum bum bumbley tuna ever hang out with the kids that wished they were an Oscar Mayer wiener? Did Ricardo Montalban ever give the Frito Bandito a ride in his Cordoba? And when he did, did he describe the beauty of Corinthian leather? Did Aunt Jemima ever hook up with Uncle Ben? And did they settle down on Colonel Sanders' plantation? Did Mr. Clean ever come out of the closet? Did he discover that Ajax laundry detergent was stronger than dirt? Did Alexa Hente ever have lunch with Juan Valdez? And when they did, did the whole town celebrate? Did the Coca-Cola choir singing on the mountain in perfect harmony ever invite G.I. Joe or the folks that shot cereal from guns to join them on the mountain? Did Charlie the Tuna ever meet Morris the Cat? What did they talk about? And is the Alka-Seltzer porking stomach still arguing with the guy that ate that pepperoni pizza? The world has changed quite a bit since the 1960s. The Marlboro man died long ago of lung cancer. And as I flip back and forth each morning from MSNBC to Fox for my news, it seems that both sides may need a nice Hawaiian punch. Baby boomers can argue with millennials over who has the better advertising characters. The Geico lizard, the Aflac duck, and Flo may be good insurance salesmen, but I still would rather be in good hands with Allstate than ride around with some guy called Mayhem. Star Trek. Star Trek. Profound, profound experience on many of my generation Star Trek. So this is called the Star Trek diaspora. Much of what I learned in life came from Star Trek. Captain Kirk taught me about leadership. Mr. Spock about logic. Dr. McCoy taught me about friendship. And Scotty about engineering. Uhura taught me the importance of clear communications. Yeah. And Chekhov and Sulu, the benefits of diversity. As a bachelor between marriages, I slept better at night knowing I had all the original Star Trek episodes upstairs in my closet. <laughs> my bachelor status was confirmed by the six foot tall Godzilla that stood guard in my living room. My nieces and nephews knew when they entered the living room, it ringed by Star Trek plates, they would be transported to my grade B monster movie collection, Christmas, Easter, Thanksgiving, 
were not complete without a viewing of the attack of the 50 foot woman. Plan nine from outer space, white zombie or the wasp woman. Rutgerd Kipling said man did not become tame until he met woman. He said she hung a dried wild horse skin tail down across the opening of the cave and said, wipe your feet, dear, when you come in and we'll, now we'll keep house. After I fell in love with Susan, Godzilla left my living room. <laughs> but the Star Trek plates remained as the portal to the Grade B monster movie. One day, as the windows of the TV room were being fitted for new blinds, I heard a woman with a Brooklyn accent say to Susan, the plates, they're his, aren't they? <laughs> I was reminded again of Kipling. He didn't even begin to be tame till he met the woman, and she told him that she did not like living in his wild ways. How does one reconcile what one was with what one wants to be? Are there limits to what one would give up for love? St. Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. The Star Trek plates would need to be transported out of the spaceship that had been my home. The nieces and the nephews were not pleased when they heard the Star Trek plates were leaving. Nieces Dawn and Sasha presented a petition to soon to be Aunt Susan. We, the nieces and nephews of Uncle Dan, demand that the Star Trek plates stay at his home to let us know we are always welcome here. Soon to be Aunt Susan responded, when you get your own homes, you can decide what hangs on your walls. There were 15 nieces and nephews and eight Star Trek plates to distribute. Solomon said, divide the living child in two and get half to one and half to the other. I made a harder choice. The niece and nephew who was most like Kirk, Spock, McCoy, Chekhov, Uhura, Sulu, Scotty, and the crew in the transporter, they would get an individual plate and the other seven would just have to tr trust my judgment. More than 20 years later, Captain Kirk is in New Hampshire. Mr. Spock lives in Germany. Scotty resides on Long Island. Chekhov hangs his hat in Texas. And Aurora communicates in Washington, DC. As of this star, star date, Sulu, Dr. McCoy, and the crew of the transporter are still lost in space. Each of us beginning a committed relationship with the one we love needs to clear space taken up by our own Star Trek plates for building new memories with the partner we love. The challenge will always be, how do I let go of who I was without losing myself? The Star Trek plates now are all gone, but all the original Star Trek episodes are still in the upstairs closet. And I do have a triple in my home office. Plan nine from outer space, attack of the 50 foot woman, white zombie and the wasp woman are upstairs in the closet too. The nieces and nephews will have to decide which videos to view on Easter. Thank you. Winding up here with one short one and one kind of short one. I'm a college professor. Then one for something really, I, one of the schools I taught at was uh, the MBA program at uh, Stony Brook. And something happened to me three or four years ago. It was like a Twilight Zone episode. I said, something is going on today. It's really important. And I, I, I don't know who it is, but this is a really important day. And I realized it was the 40th anniversary of the first year I taught accounting. <laughs> So my youthful appearance, notwithstanding, I've been, I've been teaching a long time. So in the teaching environment today is a bit different than what it was back in 1978. So in this context, I present to you a poem called My Pronouns. The, DE, the DEI Compliance Committee has been monitoring your email. And we have noted you are not in compliance with our DEI policies. Your course email signature does not include your pronouns. Please add one or more of the appropriate pronouns below. He, him, or his. She, her, or hers. They, them, theirs. Z, zer, or zers. 
Well, my heart leaps with joy knowing that there are DEI Pharisees monitoring my emails. I will add my preferred pronouns and they are our, we, and us. The same ones Jesus used when he taught the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven is the father of lesbians, gays, bisexuals, transgender, and last but not least, heterosexuals too. We, we are the children of God. We ask God to forgive us for our sins as we forgive others. I hope the compliance committee will forgive me for not using my pronouns and consider the pronoun guidance provided by Jesus in Matthew chapter six. Okay. Okay, this is my last poem. Linda gave me time parameters, which I want to respect. And this one is, I guess, a commentary on marriage. And I've been happily married. My beautiful wife, Susan, is back there for almost 30 years now. So no need to applaud. I'll, I'll applaud. It's the only reason I can do so many things is because I have Susan who supports and gives me the space and time to do it. So this one is called, appropriate for those involved in marriage, Pride Cometh Before the Fall. Husbands and wives of many years often struggle to find things they enjoy doing together. Our little church does an annual 5K run. We decided to run the route every Saturday morning. And so began an interesting journey of discovery. Each time we ran, I was always ahead. I knew to pick up the pace whenever I heard the pounding sound of her little feet. As the weeks passed, she added treadmill time to her daily exercise routine. I told her I did not think my well-honed exercise routine needed any tinkering. One fateful day in July, I could not escape the pounding of her little feet. As I looked over my shoulder to see how close she was, I heard the first warning. Don't look back, you'll fall. Each time I look back, I ask myself, what was I running from? And why was I so fearful that she would pass me? Is she the old man from the Twilight Zone episode that the young woman driving across country kept seeing on the road? Don't look back, you'll fall. Am I Bobby Riggs about to be embarrassed on national TV by Billie Jean King? Don't look back, you'll fall. Am I Ca a Cosmo Castorini from the movie Moonstruck about to be told by his wife, Cosmo, you're gonna die anyway. <laughs> Don't look back, you'll fall. As I looked over my shoulder the fourth time, I did not see the sticks in the road and landed hard on the asphalt road. As I lay in the street and assessed the damage I had done to my ankle, my ribs, both shoulders, my elbow and my knee, I found the answer to, to my question. As both Caesar and Punch's pilot learned the hard way, sometimes husbands simply need to heed the warnings of their wives. Pride does indeed cometh before the fall. Okay. Thank you so much, Dan. It's so glad you came. <laughs> are, are they all clapping still? They are clapping. Wow. Clap again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. Brendan is crowd control. <laughs> okay. So Dan will be back to do an encore later. Um, but now we begin the open mic. Not yet. <laughs> you guys didn't come in first. I put you down exactly when you came in. So don't worry, I will get to you. And don't worry, the bus is not gonna leave without you. It's all good. Okay, so Brendan McEntee, come on down. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, that was wonderful. Cool to hear you, thank you, Northport Arts. And Lyndon and Dave. Dave, mm -hmm. everybody. This is a poem called Meaning. Something like this one. I got a little mm -hmm. hard. Meaning. 
There are soft days in February. Cloudless skies look forgiving. The ground looks like it might yield. There's a thread of hope in the cold, lurking like a premonition of danger. We're looking for one another by the Washington Square arch. I see her first. Wind catches her ivory overcoat while gray sunlight lights the bronze notes of her hair. Brown gloves and matching boots. She smiles and we both light up. This is dangerous how easily I could get used to this. Thank you. Right. Okay, so live from Pennsylvania, Jane Wyman. Different for today. The beauty in nature is never ending. We are surrounded by the glory of God, the ever-changing tides, the seasons all fly by, and yet sometimes we cannot see God. We live in a little box, which restricts us to no end. We are like little soldiers following the order of life. Someday let us try to break free of our box and throw our restrictions to the wind and dare to be different today. That's it. Thank you. Go get him, Jane. Nice job. Okay, so I don't have to move, uh, but I will give you the lineup because I want David to know where he fits into this. So, Mr. Todris, you are next. David Dickman is in between you and Elizabeth. So that's the next three poets. John Todris, David Dickman, and Elizabeth Todris. Yes, and that was an amazing feature. To tell you the truth, you had me hysterical. But that's not easy to do. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to do, I actually wrote a poem and converted it into a song. Um, it has to do with the fact that uh, people who own dogs sometimes find that uh, you don't walk the dog, the dog walks you. So uh, I'm going to get my wife over here and I'll sit at the piano. I'm going over there. Man, that was a long trip over from my computer. Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, when? My dog wants to visit dog neighbors. I know from the tone of that bark when I feel like resting, my dog feels like pestering. Oh, please, let's go walk in the park. My dog loves to roll in the laundry, then pull Sunday's paper apart. When I'm feeling tired, my dog will inquire. A twisted, four-legged question mark. Oh, what must I do for an hour of peace? That dog wants some more doggy rations. Stretching high, my dog pleads, and in canine, a sneeze. Achoo! Then whines, I need stimulation. My dog wants to play with the frisbee. I freeze, but my dog will not mope. Tail high, eyes blink, head tilts, then thinks how to put me through more doggy ropes. In no way has doggy lost hope. Thunderbark, rip, thunderbark. My dog sniffs at my apple strudel. I say no, go away. But my dog reasons, hey, at least get me oodles of poodles. 
my dog loves to ride to the country and run through a field in the sun. When I shout, time to leave, my dog will not retrieve and plays deaf when I yell out, come. More times than not, doggy has won. When I am reclining, that doggy starts whining. When I'm feeling distant, my dog gets insistent. When I'm feeling wasted, my doggy starts chasing. I think we've been stuck in a rut. I can't be complacent. Life's no barking basement. With this mutt. Roar, roar. Thank you. You don't think I was barking up the wrong tree, do you? <laughs> what? I'm not sounding them. Well, ow! <laughs> By the way, Elizabeth and I, uh, on Sunday, will be participating in the New York City Poetry Festival with a group called the West Side Arts Coalition, and maybe some others. Tonight, it's a free event on Governor's Island all day, and tomorrow in the rain. <laughs> Thank you. David Dickman. David Dickman. Yes, this is David Dickman. Um, on uh, Sunday, I will be reading this at an interment, so you're just a bunch of uh, guinea pigs tonight. Uh, it's a classic by Henry Jackson Van Dyke, Gone from My Sight. I am standing upon the seashore, a ship at my side, spreads her white sails to the moving breeze and starts. For the blue ocean, she is an object of beauty and strength. I stand and watch her until at length she hangs like a speck of white cloud just where the sea and sky come to mingle with each other. Then someone at my side says, there, she is gone. Gone where? Gone from my sight, that is all. She is just as large and mast and hull and spar as she was the day she left my side. And she, and she is just as able to hear her load of living freight, to bear her load of living freight to her destined port. Her diminished size is in me, not in her. And just at the moment when someone says, there she is gone, there are other eyes watching her coming and other voices ready to take up the glad shout, here she comes. And that is dying. Thank you. Elizabeth, are you also going to um, add something on? Oh. Oh, I was going to read just one poem for now. Please. Only one. Um, it's not too long and it's not too short. Anyway, uh, this is what it is. It's called Winter's Fingers. Okay. Because it's been so hot and humid. Surreptitiously, winter reaches with gnarled fingers into autumn's restless season. Its touch frosts grass, makes leaves flee trees, eddy erratically in brisk breezes, sail in the gale, tumble frenetically. They stampede. Marching legions charge, lunge through the landscape. Thank you. You're fine. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, I have to change this up a little bit because um, David and John's bus is here, but she said it's okay, they can read. So, David Ira Fox, come on down. Okay, this is called Spiritual Limerick. It was a man whose spirit was worn 
but a hole in his spear was torn. He was only lost all his wares when he prayed to the man upstairs. He found that his soul was reborn. Yeah, there you go. There's no way to it. No Some of my poems are come out of love. Mostly they send from the man up, up about above the house to compose them, to inspire, amuse. Yes, God is, is my a my heavenly mouse. Okay. Just stay down. Thanks. No, 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 yeah. You might just want to hang it. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> the other way. That's it. Yeah, I Hi, thanks for having me today. This is really lovely. Um, it was a little hard to find a poem that fit the constraints of today. <laughs> but I found one. It's called Conflict. <laughs> Funny, right? <laughs> I approached the lavender field with heavily booted feet, prepared for muddy battle, rocky walkways, and impending deluge of rain. The sun directly overhead etching into my skin, unusually brown for this time of year. The retreat from myself has been blankets and ground in anywhere but my bed, a falsehood that aloof outdoors is self-care and a pillow fort depression. All I can hear are buzzing bees and my thoughts. The lavender eventually quieted, quieting the latter. Surprisingly, the ground is not the war zone I had anticipated, my crammed feet feeling betrayed. A deep blue Adirondack chair swims in the bushes. I take a seat in its embrace. The bees and lavender and breeze and sun lift the heavy boots from my feet. I wiggle my toes, lavender soothing the worry, the far, the run. I forget the firmness, only hear the buzzing. That's beautiful. Well, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to give you the next couple of people, but I'll be back up here anyway. Miss Judy J.R. Turek, it's, <laughs> it's your turn. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, wonderful reading. Um, and I will tell you, in your honor, the minute Linda said, and now I want to introduce Daniel Munchkin had a wonderful bark fest at the front door in your honor, because we know how much you enjoy that. So Dan, poetry roulette from Dog Speak, 24 poems in a 24 hour poetry marathon. Please pick a number from one to 24. Mickey Mano was one of my heroes, number seven. Number seven. <laughs> I love number seven. I love number all of them. 
And it's funny, I think we mentioned this earlier too. Must be Freud. Nothing better. Bacon. Bacon, bacon, we love bacon. Bacon treats, bacon kibble, bacon gravy on bacon potatoes, bacon in, on, with everything, bacon. You humans are odd. Bacon raw, but never crisp. Bacon crisp, but never raw. Bacon strips warmed over, but we don't care. It's bacon. Bacon in the middle of two slices of bacon on a bacon bread sandwich with a drizzle of bacon on top. Homemade bacon cookies, hint, hint, wink, wink, bacon. We love bacon better than anything. Bacon chews, bacon bones, bacon toys, bacon sticks, bacon. Nothing better than bacon. Bacon Bacon, oh, chicken, chicken wings, chicken skin sizzling, chicken treats, chicken kibble with chicken gravy. Nothing better than chicken. Oh, wait, beef. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Judy. <laughs> I feel like you should have sizzle in the background, you know. <laughs> okay, Carol Finkel, you are up next, followed by Christine Barber. The current takes me, although I try to row. I like to be in command. I want to control my environment. It is frightening to know that it doesn't matter what I like or what I want. The water will do as it wishes. I row with all my strength and sometimes make no headway and even drift backward. It is more intense in a sailboat. Now I am at the mercy of both the wind and the current. I know I can reef my sails, but that only helps a little. When the wind and the current are with me, I glide with no worries. I glide with ease. I gently glide. I am at peace. When the wind does not cooperate, I must fight to stay my course. I must tack. I make little headway and find myself drifting close to shore. I must maneuver and come about in desperation to get it back on course. I might even have to drop my motor into the calmness that sailing brings. If there is little wind, the sail luff. The current gets its way. I feel the ebb and flow. I cannot choose the direction. When there is no wind, I am in irons. I sit. I can do nothing until I give in and motor. The noise of the engine ruins the tranquil peace that I long for. In order to regain my control, I surrender the serenity. I, def I, def I defeat the purpose to achieve the stillness I crave, I am humbled. I am not the master of my fate. Thank you, Carol. And uh, Miss Christine, did you uh, get your hair cut? No. <laughs> no. Back? Okay, it looked like it was I just- have... you know... Yeah, yeah, some of it's pulled back. Okay, just checking. Okay, Christine Barber, you are up, followed by Maureen Spiza. Okay. This is called House of Stone. We visited you in a stone building. Children would not allowed. I waved up to you on Saturday mornings, Saturday after Saturday. You waved down to me where I stood in the tightly meshed grass that you would not feel between your toes for two months of summer. Childhood long over, I wondered if my life would have a stopover like yours in a house of stone. Would the pink cuckoo flowers wrap me in a steel coat of madness that I could not escape from? And would I sink and keep on sinking into the abyss 
and would you come to visit me and wave? Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. Uh, Maureen Spizak is up next, followed by Stephanie Kalpas. Recipe for summer day. One saucy July day, no humidity. One beach chair with a cup holder. One bottle of suntan lotion, SPF 40. One notebook with writing utensil. One large container of iced tea. And one camera just in case. Gather all ingredients and place in your car. Begin early around eight o'clock. The beach will belong solely to you and the gulls. Carefully place your chair where the sea sound whispers its secrets in your ear. Stroll the beach searching for sleeping shells, rounded stones, green sea glass, or an osprey feather for your hat. Carry your treasures back to your chair. Play with them a while, lay them out, create an altar. Sit back in your chair, slide your toes under the grainy sand, empty your mind, quiet your soul, and let serene settle in. Thank you. Beautiful, Maureen. Thank you so much. Okay, Stephanie Kalpas, do you have something for us this evening? Sure. Two fat ladies. No angels here, no stars, no trees. I met them then and now again. They are not worldly, nor are they earthy. Just two fat ladies. Diabetes does everyone have it? They don't do anything about it, the two fat ladies. They don't sleep, they told me. They color for hours. Lots and lots of colored pencils adorn their table. Lots and lots of coloring books, grown-up coloring books. Maybe they color angels or stars or trees. Who knows? They knew Lonnie back then. One of them went out with him. He said they were gorgeous. Oh, by the way, they're twins, the two fat ladies. They live nearby. They say their house is very messy. I can find page two. Wait, hold on. Here we go. The two fat ladies wear baseball caps. I've never seen them without their caps. I see them at Target and at Panera, but never at their house. They say it's too messy. We're meeting for lunch tomorrow at P.F. Chang's. If you're there, look for two fat ladies wearing baseball caps. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very you. much, Stephanie. Oh, you're welcome. Okay. That was fun. <laughs> I'm glad. How did you find out about us? Carol. Carol Finkel. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, Bruce Johnson, come on down. Bruce, 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 Bruce. <laughs> Dan, great reading. Thank you. Thunderstorm. A screen door flaps and slams. Marauding winds infiltrate and contort tree branches. The curious have taken shelter, but don't be hasty. Smell the ocean. Watch the sun disappear behind scudding clouds. Feel the sting of sand in the air. Be a weatherman. Be influenced by thunder and reckless lightning as it slithers across the drenching sky. Live for a moment in the horizontal rain. Then go ahead, go inside and shiver and huddle with the rest.
Thank you, Bruce. Next up is Megan Dausch, followed by Gary Ivins. Gary said to me. This is called um, Wild. <clears throat> In Juno, a bear strolls down a neighborhood street. The only trace it leaves behind a track pressed into the mud. Even <clears throat> though this is a city, the wilderness is a part of life woven into the community. So many of us fear the untamed, the animals of the unknown, the vines and weeds that twist. We prune them, avoid them at all costs, pretend they're far away. Here, we don't have the facade of a concrete jungle to give us a false sense of protection. Sometimes, fear slips in on soft soles. Sometimes, the unknown looms as large as a grizzly, rushes in as fast as a black bear running down a hill. When fear moves towards me, I want to will myself to imagine it's a bear just looking for food, loping by. To remember that the wild is a part of us, pushing away fear will only do more harm than good. Just like in Alaska, where a bear is always near, even when fear remains hidden in the woods, I'm never far from its grasp. Maybe fear won't won't be my enemy, but a part of my ecosystem. Take a breath, don't flee. Give it space to retreat. Let it find its resting place until we meet again. Thank you. Indeed, indeed. That was great, Megan. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, please hold. Okay, Gary Ivins, come on down. You're going to be followed by Ann Cohen, who is going to be followed by Joe. Gary. Gary. Yeah. Okay. This is a. This is called the Little Death I Live. Uh, it's, it started as a poem in '96. And I revised it as a song in 2002, but I'm gonna, it's back to a poem right now because this is the little desk I live. <clears throat> Sifting through the rubble, through the bramble, through my baggage, sorting out my laundry, I'm tossing out the darkage, trampling down the timeline from the womb to tomb, I travel through the wastelands and the sewers of this episode called My Life. But when I think I want to call it a day, when I'm thinking that enough is enough, when I Finally want to throw in the towel when I call foul. This game's too tough. I can hear the mist whistling. I can hear the wheels are turning. I can smell the fresh dawn rising. I can feel my heart yearning, burning down the timeline of the little deaths I've lived. Groping in the mire of desires, one last letdown, I sip the tears of martyrs. I'm drunk inside a minute. Tipsily, I stumble down the corridor of crisis. I lick the floor. It tastes exactly how I feel. Now I tread lightly over flower beds I float that veil the hidden minefields, so lightly do I go. If I misstep, if I'm inept, I'm shot to kingdom come. The fatal blow's delivered, and I'm done. But then I can hear the mister whistling. I can see the wheels are turning. I can smell the fresh dawn rising. I can feel my heart a yearning, yearning through the timeline, burning down the timeline of the little deaths I've lived. I've been tripping, I've been stumbling over the blocks that I've been building. The bricks that I've been stacking tumble, crumble, and crash, and crazy from up on high. But I put back the pieces, brush the dust, smooth out the creases. It's so bewildering that I'm born once more every time I die. Searching for the answers, I leave no stone unturned. I seek the perfect master. I knock upon his hut. The door swings open wide, but the master doesn't answer. But a dancer that the master gave the answer to does. She asked me why I've come. I says, I'm seeking peace and light. She says, you look depressed. I says, baby, you got that right. She says, you know, that's a hopeful sign as she sweeps my debris, the shards and the shrapnel of my shattered hopes and dreams, but then I could hear the whistle. And then it goes, you know, you know the rest. It would be great if you had read that slower because it really was a great poem. Yes, it was. I think Gary has fun when he gets up here. I really, do you, what, what is your instrument? 
<laughs> What's your inst guitar? Think about bringing it down. Think about it. You don't have to do anything about it. Just think about it. I don't. I didn't realize. Yeah, you'd have to. If it's not acoustic, yeah. So I thought it was acoustic. Okay. Okay, Anne and Joe, you guys are up. Okay, I have some summertime uh, haiku for you, uh, all about bugs. I'll, I'll uh, read each one twice. Cicadas in trees, buzzsaw, a shrill serenade, no relief from heat. Cicadas in trees, buzzsaw, a shrill serenade, no relief from heat. Make room for new growth. Cicadas must shed their skin. To change is to live. Make room for new growth. Cicadas must shed their skin. To change is to live. Why believe those spots? Ladies don't reveal their age. Ladybugs are frauds. Why believe those spots? Ladybugs don't reveal their age. Ladybugs are frauds. I'll pass this over to the mister. Okay. So this is Come to the Quiet. To the Arboretum, I did fly it to enjoy the peace and quiet. Airplane motors humming, yacht engines thrumming, one on railroad trains clacking, mosquito hordes attacking. What's that you say? Can't hear you over the leaf blower anyway. Yeah, I get that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Emmy Sue, you are up next, followed by Brian Garrity. Okay, great reading, Dan. I'm gonna read one called, The Wind is Stealing the Tomatoes. The wind in its bluster and greed toppled the young tomato plant, narrow bottomed pot, a real pushover. Soil spilled onto the wood deck, branches sprawled across whimpering basil siblings, silent witnesses to the tussle. The tomato plant no match for pelting rain, taunting thunder, the gale clawing at green buds tucked inside a canopy of leaves. Time to let go, pierce the earth, loosen soil, allow roots unswaddled, unsupervised to reach their depth, form a ballast to support the weight of growing up, learning the sweep of bend and bow to defend hard-won treasures against a thieving wind. Thanks. I mean, Sue, we, we have to talk because I've got lots of tomatoes poems. <laughs> we have so many parallel poems, it's not even funny. I love it. Thank you so much. Brian Garrity, come on down. Hey, everybody. Good to see everyone. Um, it's always so weird when the podium is really low. It's just like, oh, wow. Am I headless on camera? Are we good? I could step back, too. Okay. Okay. Um, so I was going through my phone. I found an old one that I forgot that I wrote. Uh, so we're going to edit it out loud. Uh, the <laughs> The day the sun disappeared. I watched the small child reach out and pinch the sun between his index finger and thumb. As he lingered, two fingers closed, his curiosity arose and he separated them to see the sun still lit to his surprise. He smiled and snapped his fingers back in place as though connected by a bungee cord. He kept them closed, treating the distant sun as though it was a flickered out matchstick, no longer smoldering in front of his face. Thank you.
Well, I can put my hand up here because I know better than to think that you can see me. Oh. <laughs> okay. Okay, Julian, we would be happy to hear from you. I'm so glad you could join us tonight. Hi, everyone. Um, explaining poetry to a nine-year-old. Poems are boring, you say. It puts me to sleep. Each of us is a poet, I say. Even if you don't know it, look at the moon. You could say that the moon is a bright yellow balloon. But, you say, it only reflects light makes none of its own. The moon is not a balloon because it's airless and has no strings attached. Maybe that is why I say it is so consistent and why it will outlast humanity. It influences, but not in the way influences do. It knows when to shine and when to disappear. And it's just near enough to affect us, but not too close to spin us out of orbit. So too poetry. But the moon has a dark side, you say, which it never shows us. Yeah, I say, we all have a dark side. And most people don't care to see it. It's only when it's on full display that we lose it. Some of us may empathize when you show it. Most of us may turn away. Dark sides matter. But it's your own private business, like the moon. Keep it to yourself. I get you, you say. But you write a lot of sad stuff. I do, I say. The sad stuff may come from my dark side, but it's art. And all art is poetry, and all poetry is a means to connect to our humanity, to life, to reflect the light in all of us. So the moon, you say, is a lot like us? Yes, I say. I love the moon, you say. I love the moon too, I say. There, did you see what we just did? We, you and me, just wrote a poem. And it didn't put us to sleep, and it wasn't boring. Now go write another. Can it be about the sun, you ask? Yes, I beam. That's a good place to start. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Julian. And I'm glad to get to see your face for 30 seconds. Don't disappear. <laughs> I love your smile. <laughs> okay, I get to read next, followed by Daniel and his encore. Did I get everybody so far? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Crowd Control. <laughs> this is called Ghost Ranch. It goes with my shirt. What could I say? Theme dressing, Abiquiu, New Mexico. We were advised to go by another way, snaking along mountain roads for hours in a chromatic khaki, flagged with cattle, goats, dogs, modest homes, wee post offices, arrays of discarded appliances sitting like strays, all the time moving, all the time elevating, all the time wondering, would we ever reach the ranch? A slice of fiery opal blazed, the blue mesmerizing, unsettling, derailing. The beauty like sirens in the desert, distracting eyes from the highway, and all at once, the signature animal skull. The narrow trail of dust leading, now crawling toward our goal. Rancho de los Brujos. Ranch of the witches, our nostrils filled with the dust of ages, wranglers, cattle thieves, murderers, and the ghost of a scraggy, persistent tumbleweed of a woman obsessed with peak and cloud. Thank you. Daniel, yeah, yeah, then. Yeah. <laughs> So I'd like to um, start by thanking all of you. This has been a real wonderful experience for me to come back home to Northport and to, to read and also hear all the other wonderful poets in this community. 
many of you, I've read your uh, poetry for the first, I heard your poetry for the first time and it was quite moving. Keep up the good work. And uh, my encore here is called Our Lady of the Lakes. And it's about my mom. So we grew up, they all, like many people on Long Island, they started in Brooklyn. They kept moving further and further out east and they ended up here in Ashrokan. So the North Port was our home. <laughs> And I was the youngest of eight kids. And then they decided to move to Florida. And I didn't go, which was a great disappointment. But they had a great life down there. So they moved down there in 74. And my mom, my dad died in 1990. And they moved back in 1990. She moved back in 1997. So this poem is about my mom. It's called Our Lady of the Lakes. <clears throat> After 80 plus years and the death of my father and a few strokes, it was time for my mom, Vivian, to leave Northport, to leave Florida and move back to Northport for the last chapter of her life. Her house in Miami Lakes was empty. <clears throat> her car was donated to charity. All we needed to do was for her to attend her last mass at Our Lady of the Lakes Church before we boarded the plane with her faithful dog, Murphy, to write the last chapter of her life in Northport. The pastor knew this was Vivian's last mass at the church and the church members she knew, loved and helped for 23 years were told she was returning to Northport and to be with her family. Unsteady on her feet and mumbling a bit, she held my arm as we made, as she made her way to the altar. Vivian would join the altar procession this last Sunday and read the scriptures to the congregation from the altar during her last mass at Our Lady of the Lakes Church. The Old Testament reading that day was from Genesis. Moses had come down from the mountain and his face was aglow because he had seen the face of God. As mom got up from her chair on the altar and made her way to the lectern, her gait became strong and steady and her voice suddenly sounded as clear as thunder. When she read the passage about Moses, I could swear her face was glowing as well. At that moment, me, the youngest of her eight children and the Lady of the Lakes congregation saw the face of God in this old woman. The last chapter back in Northport was happy. Children and grandchildren visited her often and her faithful dog Murphy enjoyed the change in seasons, especially his first snowfall. Eventually, Father Time caught up with her. Dementia set in. She lost the ability to drive and her independence, too. Every Sunday after church, I would bring her the Eucharist, and we would share communion together in her living room. Her last stroke was a big one. She lost her ability to talk and to swallow. A feeding tube replaced meals with her family, and a nursing home replaced her last home in Northport. I still visited her after church and brought her communion. Since she could not swallow, I would dip my finger in the consecrated wine and place the blood of Christ on her lips. Whenever she received the consecrated wine, her face glowed, just like Moses coming down from the mountain. And that day when she read the scriptures at her last mass at Our Lady of the Lights. Thank you. Wow, that is all I can say. Um, I would like to thank everybody for being here. And I would like to also tell you that next month, our uh, feature is part of the Indian diaspora. She is in, she lives in Texas and her name is Usha Akella and her work is beautiful. So she will be uh, visiting us live via Zoom, um, not in person. So I just want to give everybody a heads up, but I, I heartily suggest that you attend in any way that you can, because she's just wonderful. So with all of that, I will bid you a fond good night. Adieu, as it were. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. And my husband. Thank you, David. <laughs> my, my favorite roadie. <laughs> <laughs> okay kids so i'm just gonna say good night and i'll let david uh, uh close it out as he will and we are recording this 
if anybody would like a copy. Okay. And you ran a tight ship too. You did a good job. She does do a good job. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. You can stop recording. Thank you. Yeah, you can. Good night, kids. Good night, good night. Good night everyone. Thanks, Linda. Thanks, David. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, David. Welcome. <laughs> good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Hi, doll. Hi, children. <laughs> when next month will we, will we meet again here? Until next month. Unless mm -hmm. we see you in person sooner. <laughs> but the last the last one of the, and the cool. last week of the month or, or... The last, generally that's the last Friday. <laughs> the last Friday of the month. Okay, thank you. I'll be sending you a, an email in a little bit part of after tomorrow. So I I, I I share it with a lot of people. No, I'm, 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 I'm delighted. I'm I see that you did share tonight, so it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, we have Poetry Street tomorrow afternoon from two to four. Okay. So I have to get that email together. So maybe I'll see you guys then. Take care. Good night. Good night. It's a lot. I Yeah, it's not even the news of the benefits of the 